Uh, this is the uh, exciting time each year when we uh, look at uh, uh, what's happening in China and uh, its relations with the rest of the world, bringing together uh, colleagues from, from China, from around Australia, from around the world to share our interests. And every year is an interesting and important year in uh, Chinese economic development, uh, and we're certainly meeting now at an interesting time. Uh, the last year has confirmed a big tendency that uh, we noted in the conference two years ago uh, that uh, the global financial crisis has left a legacy of uh, uh, sluggish economic growth, probably a new trajectory of lower growth in the old industrial countries without inhibiting the growth momentum in the big developing countries uh, led by China. And that's leading to uh, an acceleration of trends we've been observing for some time, of uh, rapid growth in China's uh, relative importance in the uh, global economic and political system. Uh, and big changes like that uh, need uh, big thoughts to uh, understand them, uh, to work out their implications, including for Australian policy. Uh, and. Uh, Many of us uh, share a concern that uh, Australian thinking hasn't quite caught up with the implications for our policy uh, of uh, the historic development in China. Well, that's part of the background of, of our discussion to, uh, today. I'm uh, very glad that you're all here uh, to share that with us. And uh, uh, to get things going, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction. Uh, so, Rod Eddington, colleagues, friends, uh, good morning. And on behalf of the Australian National University, I'd like to welcome you here to the 2011 China Update. Uh, the annual China Update conference, hosted by the Rio Tinto ANU China Partnership uh, and supported by AusAid, uh, is a cornerstone event uh, that showcases our expertise and our impact, I think, on a very significant part of the world. Uh, we're proud that we have one of the strongest concentrations of expertise on China anywhere in the world, outside of China, naturally. China is critically important to this university as a partner. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of that. 25% uh, of our international students come from China. ANU uh, is the host of the Australian China in the World uh, Centre, and China ranks fifth behind US, UK, France, and Germany for co-publication with ANU researchers. Uh, and I think if you watch those statistics, I think you'll see it rapidly move up that list over the uh, over 10 years. The Year in China Intensive Language Program for undergraduate students is an important part of the ANU Asian Studies Program, and I think demonstrates uh, very much our commitment to immersion as an important element of both language and cultural studies. For many Australian universities, China engagement tends to stop at international student recruitment. That's certainly not the case uh, at ANU, where interactions are much deeper and multifaceted. In the past 12 months, we've hosted visits from numerous Chinese officials, and I'll just mention a few of them. China's Vice President, the Minister for Science and Technology, the Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Vice Minister of the Ministry of Education, Vice Chairman of China's National Development and Reform Commission, as well as numerous senior officials from governments, universities, and groups such as the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. These activities help to make uh, the connections that enable the exchange of research and ideas. The Australia-China Climate Change Forum that I hosted earlier this year is another example of the university engaging uh, and spreading its expertise uh, in one of the most challenging public policy debates that faces the world today. The theme of this year's update is significant, accommodating China's rise in a way that ensures future global economic and political stability and prosperity is one of the most important and challenging tasks facing the world community. Analyzing and debating the issues surrounding the development of China uh, will be useful not only for academic research, but also policy and strategic discussions. 
The rapid development of China presents challenges and opportunities for ANU, and indeed for the university in, in Australia more broadly, the university sector in Australia more broadly. Research, knowledge transfer, and expert input into public policy can help to address the increasing range of economic, social, and environmental challenges, not just in China, but globally. I hope that you have a productive and fruitful day today in discussing these important issues, and I in particular look forward to welcoming Nigel Wayne Swan, Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer, to address the audience later today. Now, the item that I'm really up here for, uh, our keynote address this year is to be given by Sir Rod Eddington. Sir Rod is currently non-executive chairman uh, Australia, New Zealand, and J.P. Morgan, and Chairman of Infrastructure Australia. Educated as an engineer, an excellent background, I might add, uh, at the University of Western Australia, and then at Oxford University as WA's 1974 Rhodes Scholar. So Rod's career began in transport and aviation, and he went on to become CEO of Cathay Pacific, Ansett Airlines, and British Airways before returning to Australia in 2005. So I think you can see has a very strong uh, linkage both to industry and indeed to Asia. In that same year, 2005, Sir Roy was awarded knighthood by the British government for services to civil aviation. He's recently retired as a director of Rio Tinto, um, but still maintains non-executive directorships with News Corporation Lion, China Light and Power Holdings, and the John Squire and Sons Group. Sir Rod also serves as President of the Australia-Japan Business Cooperation Committee and Chairman of the Victorian Major Events Company. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Sir Rod Eddington to give today's keynote address. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Vice-Chancellor, for that uh, very warm introduction. Uh, as I always say, an introduction that my father would have enjoyed and my mother would have believed. Um, but uh, it's my pleasure particularly to be here uh, at the ANU because this is an institution which more than any other in, in our country uh, has fostered a deeper understanding between our country and our key Asian neighbours. Clearly China is uh, a very important piece of that but uh, this university has done a lot over the years to help us develop a deep understanding of Asia. Uh, my own uh, time in Asia, as the Vice Chancellor said, included nearly 18 years working for the Swire Group in Cathay Pacific. Uh, during that time, most of it in Hong Kong, but some of it in Korea and Japan as well. Uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to be part of, as it were, of the Asian story firsthand. Um, I've said before that when I went to Asia, everything I owned would fit in two, two small steel trunks. When I returned to Australia in 97, I had a, a wonderful wife from Korea, two children, and everything I owned wouldn't fit in a 40-foot container. But that's a story for another day. Um, this particular uh, uh, workshop really is an opportunity to explore the links between Australia and China. And, and when I returned to Australia from Hong Kong in 1997, um, I, I was struck, and I remember saying to Professor Garner, who was then here at the ANU, that that my sense was that Australia's relationship with Asia was, in some sense, in schizophrenic. That we were at the heart of Asia economically because our major trading partners were in Asia. And that is even more so true today, where our three major trading partners, China, Japan, and Korea, interestingly enough, three of the dozen or so major global economies are all uh, part of Asia. So we were, as, as an economy of Australia, was at the heart of Asia. Um, but geographically, we're, we are at the edge of Asia. Uh, as, as it were, we are 10 or 11 hours south by aeroplane from Beijing. Um, and culturally, we're half, still halfway between London and Sydney. So Australia itself is on a journey. And one of the things that has struck me about coming back to our country again after some time in the UK is that in some ways, things haven't moved on very much since then. The one thing that has changed is that our economy is even more enmeshed in, in the North Asian economies. And, and now, of course, China is preeminent in that. For several decades, Japan was our major trading partner. China is not only our major trading partner in two-way trade terms, but also our, our biggest export market. So understanding China, um, not only understanding its journey, but participating as we will in its future, I think is, is, is an exciting opportunity for our country. But it, it, it does represent a change in another way. 
which is this that I grew up in, uh, in an Australia that had its roots in European settlement in many ways. And for most of the last 200 years plus since European settlement, and our major trading partners, in fact, have been the United Kingdom and America. Um, more recently, in the second half of the 20th century, Japan and now China. Um, and of course, we understood uh, with our shared history, as it were, much more about Europe and about North America than we have about Asia. So it's doubly important that institutions like the ANU and uh, days like this give us a chance to strengthen our understanding of Asia and, and our links <coughs> China, it's interesting, uh, you can not pick up a, a magazine or turn on uh, a television today without a discussion about China being a key part of the day. Whether it's discussion or, around the Chinese economy, the extraordinary progress it has made uh, and the challenges it faces, or the opportunities that countries like Australia as key trading partners face. Whether it's uh, discussions around uh, Chinese politics, and who in the fifth generation will succeed the current leadership and what that means not only for their relationship with Australia but for global politics. Um, uh, whether it's a discussion around the most recent five-year plan, the 12 five-year plan that was recently released, people who wouldn't have even known uh, that the Chinese had a five-year plan in the past now uh, recognise it's important to read it, to understand it because it makes some very important points about what the senior Chinese leaders describe as successful. Um, China is, in many ways, a much more open place uh, than the, the place I visited uh, in the late 1970s when I first lived in Hong Kong. And, and in nowhere is that more obvious than, um, than the economy. Um, getting to China in, in the 70s was uh, a challenge. Um, now there are many non-stop flights from all the key gateways here in Australia to the key gateways in China. Uh, going not just to the major cities like Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou, um, but also to other important cities in the country. Looking at the investment in infrastructure and in education uh, and, and in entrepreneurship, I think just opens our eyes as Australians to the opportunities that exist in that country. One of the things I think that we will reflect on, and I think Australia is, is in a, an extremely good position here to contribute to the debate and to support uh, this journey, is that um, for many years uh, in my business life, the major economy in, in Asia was Japan. And as the Vice Chancellor said, I, I lived in Japan for four years. It's still a country like China, which is close to my heart. Um, and 18 months ago, for the first time, China replaced Japan as Australia's major trading market. Now, now the businessman in me um, is actually quite comfortable with a world in which, instead of having all our trading eggs in one basket, be it Japan or China or Korea, we have uh, opportunities in all three major economies. And the major Australian companies, like Rio Tinto, that trade with China also, have major trading relationships with, with Japan and Korea. And that's a good thing. It means we have three major opportunities in North Asia uh, rather than just one. And that's not to forget for a moment important countries with, uh, with whom we in Australia have key links, like India, Indonesia, and the other Southeast Asian uh, countries. But um, it's, it's a good thing that we have a number of key trading relationships. And one of the things I think that we, we are increasingly conscious of is that in, in particular, Japan, which is now the third biggest economy in the world, behind China and the United States of America. Uh, and when I lived in Japan, uh, again, the, the Japan relationship was very focused on the United States of America. America was the major strategic power, and it was also Japan's major trading partner. And of course, it was Japan's major market as well. Um, and today, Japan itself finds China as its major trading partner. So our two major trading partners in Japan and China have as one another a very important um, strategic interest uh, going forward. And given the, the shared history of those two countries, um, that does present itself with some challenges, but I believe it also presents us in Australia with some great opportunities. Uh, I, I look at the China story um, in many ways uh, with all. Uh, I look at the way in which the economy has transformed itself since 
Deng Xiaoping's open door policy in the late 1970s and, and what it meant for that country. Um, and, and what strikes me about China's transition through that period as an economy um, it is firstly that it has been in many ways so smooth. If you look at the development of the US economy over a century, it was a century that included a civil war, a Great Depression, and involvement in two uh, major global conflicts, World War I and World War II. Uh, China's transition in economic terms uh, has been uh, very smooth. It's, it's not that there haven't been bumps, but they've been relatively minor. And so I think as we look forward at the development of the Chinese economy and of the country, um, we, we should expect that these things never occur in a straight line. I'm a China bull, a China optimist. And as I said, I'm struck by how extraordinarily smooth in so many ways that transition has been uh, over the 40, 30, 40 years that it's taken place. Uh, we should not, in one, in one way, be surprised about that. China was the dominant global power, after all, for probably 20 of the previous 30 centuries, albeit that for much of that time it was inward looking. Um, but its transition has been remarkable. What, one of my um, concerns, if that's not too strong a word, about the relationship between uh, us and Asia, and China in particular, is the extent to which um, uh, our business community um, has yet to fully engage in what I would regard as an appropriate way. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, my generation invariably went to work in Europe if they went anywhere outside Australia after they finished at university. Very few of us went to Asia. And in a sense, I went to Asia myself via the UK, so to that extent, I suppose I followed the traditional path. But many of my generation have not worked in Asia. They may have done business with Asian companies, but they haven't worked in them. And I would hope that, that the next generation and the generation of students who are here today at this great university will take the opportunity not only to, to study the languages and the countries, in particular China, but also to work there. Because Australian businesses need men and women who understand the language and the culture and have actually spent some time on the ground. Now, there are many more of those today than there were, but one of the things that concerns me is, for example, that the study of Asian languages in our country here in Australia has stalled. Um, that it hasn't progressed in the way in which it might. Now, I grew up in Perth in Western Australia and I studied at school French and Latin. And when you live in Perth, they're both dead languages. Um, but it, it seems to me that, that today's young people, um, uh, while recognising the importance of our European heritage and a desire also to learn something of the European languages, must also take the opportunity if languages is their gift to study not only the Chinese history and, and, uh, and culture, but also the language itself. And we are seeing some of that. My concern is that it's too slow. And, and there are a number of implications for that. Uh, the, the first is that um, as the Australian-Asian economic integration continues apace, and it will continue apace, not just because our major trading partners are in North Asia, but also our country has been traditionally resource rich and capital poor and therefore we need inward investment to help us do the things that we, we can do in this great country. And historically that investment has come from uh, Europe, in the UK in particular, and North America. But increasingly it's investment from Japan and, and now China. That as that investment looks to come to Australia to help us uh, take the economic opportunities, um, it, it, it naturally arouses debate and, and the most recent opportunities for Chinese investment into our country, uh, the debate has sometimes been tinged with xenophobia. And for me, the best way to resist that if there are more and more people in our country who understand Asia, what it brings to the table, and if there are more businessmen and businesswomen who can add their voices to the debate. Because be clear, uh, capital we need, uh, whether it's to grow our own infrastructure or to take advantage of our own opportunities, not just in the resource space, but also in areas like manufacturing and agriculture. And North Asian investment, Chinese investment in particular, is a critical part of this. And it needs champions here in our country 
as well as people in North Asia who wish to take the advantages of investing in, in Australia. So one of my pleas to the business community uh, is to take advantage of uh, Asian opportunities, but in order to do that intelligently, then we need to uh, know much more about our Asian neighbours and to be comfortable in their presence. As the Vice-Chancellor said, I studied engineering many years ago uh, at the University of Western Australia, and I was struck then by um, the number of Asian students who were uh, uh, studying at university in Australia, a number of them in those days on something called the Colombo Plan. Many of these students were in fact from Southeast Asia. They were from uh, Indonesia, from <coughs> Malaysia, from Singapore, <coughs> from Hong Kong. Um, and today when I go back to Southeast Asia, um, I'm able to meet a number of them, now in very senior leadership positions, both in government and business. And I'm constantly reminded by the value that Australia uh, has received from, as it were, being part investors in the education of those men and women. Um, they became, in the vast majority of, of cases, fans of our country, they understood our country and they are an important bridge between their own countries and ours. And so one of the things that for me is refreshing about walking onto university campuses in Australia today, not just here at the ANU where uh, the best work is done in, in, uh, in the Asia links, but, uh, but also around other campuses, I'm struck by the number of uh, young Asian men and women who were studying at our campuses. And I recognise that just like those who were here in the 60s on the Colombo plan, um, many of them will return to their countries and will be lifelong supporters of, of our country and, and the opportunity to build bridges between the two. So in a sense, education as it so often is, is the great opportunity. Um, it's an economic opportunity for our country. It's now the third biggest export earner for, for Australia, uh, behind coal and, and iron ore. Um, but it's also a great bridger of, of cultures and a great driver of key, strong, long-lasting um, economic opportunities and things that survive. So in supporting this, um, this, uh, this uh, conference, I'm conscious that I'm also supporting the mix between uh, Australia and, and our Asian neighbours, in particular China. And I look forward to seeing the links between Australia and China continue to grow and the vital role you will all play in building those bridges now and into the future. Thank you very much. for Australia-India and Australia-Indonesia, both of whom are rapidly emerging economically as you refer to China. Thank you. Look, it's, it's a, clearly a very important issue, and, and the two countries are different in, in this way. There are 240 <coughs> billion in the world. Uh, I was in Jakarta a month ago with a joint infrastructure mission, um, looking at infrastructure opportunities in, in Indonesia. There are 240 million Indonesians and in the vast majority of cases, we fly right over the top of Indonesia on our way to Beijing, Seoul, Hong Kong, and Tokyo. So, um, and, and the Indonesian economy is closing one trillion dollars, so it's a bit smaller than the Australian economy, but it's growing at five, six, seven percent a year. The, the, uh, the, the predictions for the next two years are that the, uh, the economy will grow at about seven percent, so it's a very important part. And as we discovered uh, in the debate on cattle exports, live cattle exports to Indonesia, um, uh, it's an important trading partner and, and increasingly a strategic partner. Um, and again, Australia has been slow, I think, to really engage intelligently in Indonesia. And again, through the Colombo Plan, we have some good friends in Indonesia who have been here for education. So the Indonesian story is an important one. For me, this is... The, the debate about Indonesia is similar to the debate about China and Japan. It's not China or Japan, it's China and Japan. 
And if my wife was here, she would remind me to say, and Korea as well. Um, because South Korea particularly is an important piece of this jigsaw. So Indonesia matters. Um, Ten times our population on our doorstep, rapidly growing economy, and increasingly strong economic growth. India is, is also a rapidly growing power, both in economic terms, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important country in terms of its strategic geography. Um, I think it's now Australia's fifth biggest trading partner. Uh, for me, like many of you, I, I spend time in India as well as in China and North Asia. And the, the, Indian, the Indian story has been uh, mixed. Um, someone once said to me that the reason why India has been so slow to evolve and so bureaucratic is that when the British left in 1947, one of them said, we'll be back soon. Don't touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> and we the Indians believe them. Um, but, but uh, and of course, <clears throat> after the Second World War and after partition in 1947, when India finally got its independence from Britain, um, it, 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 its closest strategic partner was the Soviet Union, so its economic model was different to, to the economic model that, uh, that India embraces today. Um, India, a billion people, a rapidly growing economy, um, quite different from China in many ways, uh, in that, that whereas the Chinese have invested very heavily in infrastructure, um, it's taken the Indians a long time to begin that journey. So one of the things about India for me is that without, without really good uh, infrastructure, particularly at your, your ports and your airports and your international gateways and transport infrastructure, very good to get, very difficult to get manufactured goods to the ports and off to global markets. And India is only really just beginning to face up to that. Whereas China began that journey many years ago when I was living in Hong Kong. So, um, so India, in a sense, has almost skipped the Industrial Revolution and moved straight into the information age. Um, and in my days at British Airways, uh, many of British Airways' best software engineers were based in India. They were British Airways employees. Uh, living in places like Delhi and Mumbai. Uh, and if you had a problem, uh, an IT problem, you would simply shut it down the line at the closest player in the UK to India. And, and the Indian team, when they got in the next morning, because India was four, four to five hours ahead of the UK, would have the problem solved and on the desk by the time you got into the office at eight. So India is a major player in the global mm -hmm. services industry, particularly in those sorts of spaces. But again, I think for Australia, it's not about China or India, it's about China and India. And if we know little about China as a country, certainly not nearly enough, and I'm always conscious when I'm with this group that I'm having known uh, Ross Garner for many years and his, his understanding and passion for the China relationship in particular. This group is different in the sense that this group understands the bilateral, understands how important it is. But many in Australia are just beginning to understand the Chinese think, well, India is further behind. Um, most Australians have never got, gone to India. Um, uh, and that is a challenge for us. And again, when you walk onto university campuses, increasingly you'll see lively Indian faces as the young men and women study there. Uh, just like China, the Indians are reaching out to us. Uh, it's important we reach out to them. Others? <coughs> I think that let me off. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>